Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. Uh, that's fine. Monday, May the 1st, I'd like to welcome all of you to here with us this evening. Uh, if we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. That's Councilman Davis. Clerk, you should call the roll, please. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Moffitt. Councilmember Reese. And Councilmember Shaw.
since it's International Workers' Day, this is a testimony from somebody who worked on the work pod in Durham County Jail while he was inside. His name's Vincent. I have permission to share his name. He wasn't able to be here today, so I figured I'd read his words. Of a total inmate population that hovers around 450, only about 50 to 65 are on work detail in pod 4B. They perform various tasks on a daily basis, including laundry, preparing meals, painting walls in cells and pods and janitorial work. They do not receive any wages for their work. <laughs> Vincent writes, you can work 40 hours a week in the jail and still owe money when you get out. Like me, I was put in there for owing in child support. I worked, all, I worked most of the time I was in there. I came out and I was no better off. The people in the kitchen work from 4.30 in the morning until 6 at night. It's crazy. But they don't want anyone to know that all the wor that worker inmates do to keep the jail running. They don't want the public to know. When you go to court, you have to change out of your blue uniform signifying work pod to go to court to appear in orange. They don't want you to have any special recognition. The orange shows you are a criminal. The public, they know orange equals criminal. Even though you are doing a service for the jail, but they don't want people to know that. Because I was having trouble adjusting to being confined, I went five days without eating when I was in the jail. Mental health suggested I go to the work pod, and I accepted. Basically, it was a way for me to keep busy, keep my mind off things. The kitchen, they don't have enough kitchen staff. They are totally dependent on inmates. Most of the time, you'll have one cafeteria worker who works for Airmark. He or she is like the whipmaster, the dictator. Roughly 10 to 15 inmates per one kitchen staff paid by Airmark. That's just an excerpt. If anybody else wants to read more, um, I also have other letters from folks on the inside. These are workers. They're organizing. Let's stand with them. As a part of our program, hey, hey, look, let's let's keep the doors closed, please. Keep, keep the doors closed.
as a part of the agenda for those of you who may not have attended our meetings before. Uh, we have several proclamations that we'd like to present. Officers, will you close the doors and not let anyone else in while I'm conducting the meeting? I don't care who's out there. Just keep the doors closed, please. Uh, we have a proclamation that we'd like to present to NCCU's basketball team, and I want to see who's here from NCCU might be representing the team. Oh, the, the coach. Okay. <laughs> Well, we talk about good things happening in Durham, including the ability of persons to come in and have their voices heard. But as most of you know, this has been really a great season for two of our universities in the city, North Carolina Central University and Duke University. And it is on behalf of the Durham City Council and the citizens of Durham that we want to recognize the coach and his team and his staff for such a great season, uh, in particular their achievement of the MEAC Basketball Championship this year. And I'm not going to read the whole proclamation. You, see, you got a, somebody who can't keep quiet. She went to NCCU. She wants everybody to know it. I'll may approach him, Cora Cole McFadden. <laughs> because, Coach Moulton, look, I'm not going to read the whole proclamation. And if you have any of your team or staff here, if you'd like them to join us, that'd be fine. Huh? Is the chancellor here? Yeah, okay. I just, I just recognize. All right, Chancellor. Everybody said, you know the chances here. Yeah? Well, I'm going to get them up here. <laughs> but the proclamation reads, whereas the NCCU men's Division I basketball team won the school's second Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference Championship and advanced to the NCAA tournament, whereas this legendary season was highlighted with Coach Moulton's earning the 2017 Box Toro Coach Co-Coach of the Year and National Association of Basketball Coaches District 15 Coach of the Year after guiding the Eagles to their second Division I NCAA tournament appearance in a four-year span with a 13-3 mark in the MEAC. And whereas Patrick Cole, senior guard, was honored as Box Toro National Player of the Year, NABC All District 15 First Team and MEAC Player of the Year after finishing in the top three in the league in scoring, assists, and rebounds, where it's heading to Dayton for post-conference play with his 25-8 season record. This determined team entered the NCAA as the number 16 seed, matching up against UC Davis in the first round of play, and whereas while the Eagles played valiantly against this opponent, they experienced an end to an impressive season, finishing with the 25-9 record, whereas collectively this team will long be celebrated for its excellence, athletic prowess, and the enormous pride, sense of pride it brought to alumni, fans, and the larger community of NCCU. Now, therefore, on behalf of the Durham City Council, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby salute Coach Lavelle Moulton, his staff, and members of the 2017 NCCU men's basketball team for winning the MEAC championship and for his second appearance in the NCAA tournament and call upon all citizens in the city of Durham to join in saluting these outstanding athletes and NCU athletic staff for a job well done. We're confident in a bright future for this program and can't wait until next season. And with my hand, Corporate Seal City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the first day of May 2017. I'm going to present this to the coach and to the chancellor for any comments that you might have. Um, thank you guys so much. Uh, it never gets old to come here. That means it's always in celebration of a championship um, to these young men in front of me. Well, first of all, if y'all would have played with the same passion they were with, we would have won a national championship. <laughs> That's passion out there. But 
But, um, you know, as a coach, it's kind of easy to get recognized for something you really don't have any control over, and I get far too much credit. I told them from day one that this is always, always has and always will be a player's game, and they make me look a lot better than, than I actually am. Um, our player of the year, Patrick Cole, he's not here. He had a class, so he'll be graduating in a week and a half. But our other um, all-conference performer, Dewan Graff, right here. Raise your hand, Graff. <laughs> We played this kid 39, 40 minutes a game. And, you know, what I found out, and I told them early on in the year, um, out of 350 Division I schools, everyone's goal is to win a championship. But what you'll soon discover is a lot of people want what it looked like, but a lot of people don't want what it feels like. And that feels like uh, requires you to wake up at 5.30 a.m. and run four or five miles and then lift weights before you've eating a sandwich or some scrambled eggs or whatever, and these guys made that sacrifice. And what you're seeing is a direct result of that and incredible leadership from our chancellor all the way down. So it's really a collective effort, and I'm just standing before you as the messenger. So thank you guys so much. Thank you to Mayor Bell. Thank you to the city of Durham. We always humble. We are always honored to represent you as best that we can possibly can. So thank you so much. As you can tell, that's a very tough act to follow. He is the star. That is, that is Coach Moon. But uh, Mayor Bell, Mayor Protum, and members of the council, and to the entire city of Durham, uh, I stand here this evening to accept this proclamation on behalf of all of our faculty, our staff, our students, and our alumni. We exist here in this city because of your support because of what you do for us. And we appreciate every minute of it. And we will not let you down. We'll continue to do everything to make you proud. So once again, we thank you for recognizing this young man. And they are as good in the classroom as they are on the courts. So I want you to know that. So we thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. And we appreciate uh, the support. Thank you. Thank you. you know, somebody needs to get a picture. Mike Craig, you join us, please. Like I said, we, we're a city of champions, and this year really, really proves it. Uh, Mike, as you may or not know, is a deputy director of athletics at Duke University. And uh, get, give it up, give it up. <laughs> and the proclamation reads, whereas on March 11th, 2017, the Duke University men's basketball team rallied to win the 2017 Atlantic Coast Conference Tournament championship by defeating Notre Dame by a score of 75 to 69, 
whereas Duke men's basketball team started off the season as number one in the country for the eighth time and headed to the National Collegiate Athletic Association Division I Championship for the 22nd consecutive time. And whereas this is Mike K, coach's 37th season as head coach at Duke, which yielded 28 victories, whereas the Blue Devils won their record 20th ACC tournament championship by becoming the first team ever to win four games in four days, whereas Coach K, the only men's coach in Division I history to win 1,000 games overall, went through the 2017-18 season just two wins shy of his 1,000th at Duke, his 998th win at Duke on the most in NCAA history by a coach at one school, whereas Duke had three 1,000-point scores on his roster for the 14th time in program history as Grayson Allen, Luke Kennard, and Neil Jefferson all reached this momentous milestone. Now, therefore, on behalf of the Durham City Council, I, William B. Villarreal, Mill City of North, Durham, North Carolina, who have I salute Coach K, his staff, and members of the 2017 Duke University men's basketball team for winning the ACC championship for his 22nd appearance in the NCAA tournament and call upon all citizens in the city of Durham to join in saluting these outstanding athletes and the Durham athletic staff for a great job. With my hand, Corporal Seal, the city of Durham, this is the first day of May 2017. And again, I'm going to present this to you for any comments. Thank and let me say, you, you honor us by what, what you guys do. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Um, well, first of all, we're in final exams, so I brought no friends with me. Um, and certainly I wasn't the one out there. Um, but I've been here for 30 years uh, at Duke University and, and proud to raise our children here in Durham. And I want to thank all of you for making our city great. And Mayor, as you said, this is a city of champions. I love driving by that sign every morning um, going into, into work. And we truly, truly love everything about Durham. We appreciate all the support. And uh, it, was, uh, it was an interesting year, as you noted all the highlights, that uh, we had a lot of injuries, including our head coach being out for the month of January. And uh, these kids were tough and resilient. And those four days in Brooklyn were very special. That's, uh, they were the heart of champions and, and large support because of our city knowing they were behind them. And so we, too, are very proud to represent Durham every, every day and I'm um, very proud to work in it. And we thank you all for the support and for this proclamation. Mayor, thank you. As some of you came through the center hallway and you recognize some familiar faces. Uh, this is National Drinking Water Week. Uh, I'd like to have Arthur Lyon, if he would join me. Uh, Arthur is the plant, op plant operator at the Williams Water Treatment Plant. And the proclamation reads, whereas water is a basic and essential need of mankind, whereas our health, comfort, and standard of living depend upon an adequate supply of safe, clean water, whereas throughout the years the city of Durham has taken a lead role in source water management, and protection as well as production of a consistent supply of high quality drinking water, whereas changing climate and global warming may impact the availability of our precious natural resources, whereas our drinking water and water resources are undervalued, whereas we're all stewards of the water infrastructure upon which future generations depend, whereas dedicated individuals and organizations such as city employees, industry leaders, scientists, environmentalists, and students have made significant contributions in developing, operating, and maintaining our water treatment and distribution systems, protecting and conserving this precious resource, and educating the public on the value of this resource. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, do have our proclaim May 1st, May 7th through 13th, 2017, as National Drinking Water Week in the City of Durham, and urge all citizens to join me as a partner in the Water Use It Wisely campaign, and to pledge to embrace a water conservation ethic in order to extend the life and protect the quality of our most precious natural resource. Again, with my hand, Corpus Hill, the city of Durham, this is the first day of May 2017. I'd like to present this to you. Thank you. Are you in the comments? Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bell, City Council. I am Arthur Lyons, a certified operator at the historic Williams Water Treatment Plant. I am honored to be here today to accept this proclamation on behalf of the Water Supply and Treatment Division and all of its employees. Of Durham Water, of the Durham Water De uh, Water Management Department, producing clean, safe, healthy, and reliable drinking water takes a 24-hour commitment from our team, 365 days a year, 
And speaking of years, we've been doing this now for 100 years at the Williams plant. Even though I haven't been there the whole time, I am proud to be part of that team that ensures every one of our customers has access to clean, high quality water every time they turn on the tap. That teamwork and dedication includes each of our 300 plus department employees, from operators like me, to maintenance technicians, engineers, scientists, conservation staff, management, and more, of, of all of whom are committed to treating, delivering, and protecting Durham's water. And we look forward to carrying out this essential natural resource for the next 100 years. Thank you for taking the time tonight to recognize the vital and safe role drinking water plays in all of our lives. We appreciate the support of the council, the city administration, fellow employees, and of course, the residents of Durham who make this community such a great city. And on a personal note, Mayor Bell. Thanks again. Right. <laughs> Now, I, I know you can't help but have noticed uh, our young people out in the audience as you came through, and we're going to recognize them. I'm going to turn this over to Vicki Westbrook for comments that she may have as we do this. You going to take Willie Wonk down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can go on down there and down Good evening, everyone. As a part of our celebration of National Drinking Water Week, we'd like to take this time to recognize the winners of our department's annual poster contest. But before we move into the 2017 winners, we'd like to take a moment to recognize this lovely young lady standing in front of us, Amma Mensa Boone. Amma was the first place winner for her category last year. You may have remembered seeing her poster outside. We've invited her to join us tonight because Earlier this year, the American Water Works Association, which is the largest nonprofit scientific and educational association dedicated to managing and treating water, selected Anna's, Amma's artwork to represent the 2017 National Drinking Water Week campaign. So her artwork is being featured in this year's Drinking Water, ad, Drinking Water Week ads and promotion materials used across the country. This year we're wearing shirts, we're a little more casual than usual, but we're wearing, wearing shirts featuring Alma's design. And um, it was really cool because earlier this year we surprised her to assembly at her school wearing the t-shirts and gave a t-shirt to her family members and I believe uh, mom and dad are here. I know your little brother's wearing his shirt. <laughs> So we want to thank Alma for her great work in participating. So give her another round of applause. So we're going to ask our 2017 winners to come stand in a line so we can recognize them for their fantastic artwork. So this year, the theme was finding water, and there are a lot of interesting posters that you'll see outside. Take time to look at them before you leave. We received almost 300 posters from students in 13 different schools, and tonight we're presenting the top three posters from each of our grade, division, uh, grade divisions. We're starting with the K through 2 category, and in third place from Montessori, Moorhead Montessori Elementary is Isabel Halpern. In second place, also from Moorhead Montessori Elementary, Eden Amani Livingston. <laughs> and in first place, from Montessori Community School, Owen Herbert Reeder. <laughs> Moving on to the grades three through five category, in third place we have Ayaz Hussein from Durham Academy. In second place, Merritt Schultz, also from Durham Academy. And in first place, Beckett Moylan, Durham Academy. 
In the grades six through eight category, we have a couple of folks who aren't here tonight. Third place, Voyager Academy, Jackson Lee. Second place, Ethan Hobrich, also from Voyager Academy. And in third place, Abigail Cunningham from Voyager Academy. So we'd also like to take the opportunity to announce that each and every one of these students won in the statewide contest in their same categories. So we have all of the statewide winners in front of you right now. Thank you all. Thank you for the parents and teachers. And their artwork is on display outside. Please check it out when you leave. While they're leaving, could I ask uh, Tika Dempson if she would join me? Is she present? Oh. How you doing? You're doing well. This is presented to Tika and the Family Coordinator for Alliance Behavioral Healthcare, and it's the proclamation recognizing Children's No Health Awareness Month. Whereas to promote awareness of positive mental health, well-being, and development for all children, youth, and young adults age birth through 26 years in North Carolina. Whereas the leadership in North Carolina recognizes that mental health needs and treatment be on par with medical needs and treatment. Whereas families shall not feel stigma and shame to seek treatment for the children and youth and be able to discuss openly their need for help without public retribution. Whereas children's mental health promotion needs to be available to everyone. Education on identification and use of children's strengths to support success and promote mental health, as well as anti-stigma, inclusion, and social skills education should be available to all citizens of North Carolina, whereas available school-based mental health programs and positive behavior, intervention, and support should be considered as a best practice and be encouraged to be practiced in every Durham, North Carolina public schools, whereas children are recognized for having unique needs for recovery of mental health, emotional, behavioral, and substance use and are not being combined with adult mental health population for treatment, whereas effective mental health treatment services to strengthen families, youth leadership development, and family partner peer supports results in children and youth overcoming trauma, becoming successful and contributing Durham, North Carolina citizens in a safe environment in their homes, schools, and communities. Whereas the City of Durham, North Carolina, North Carolina Mental Health Planning and Advisory Council, National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health, Alliance Behavioral Healthcare NC, Families United, the North Carolina State Children's Collaborative and the Families, NAMI NC, Public Health Department of Social Services, all medical facilities, all legal entities and communities with children, youth, and young adults struggling with emotional and behavioral ish health issues, join to recognize Children's Mental Health Awareness Month and Safety. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, I do hereby proclaim May 2017 as Children's Mental Health Awareness Month in Durham, North Carolina, and come in this observance to our citizens and witness my hand in the Corporate Seal of the City of Durham. This is the first day of May 2017, and I'm going to present this to Tika for any comments that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be um, very brief, although I went to um, show um, Mayor Pro Tem, so maybe, maybe one day, maybe one day. I would like to thank each and every one of you for your undying commitment to the process of us partnering with our children. And when you talk about, and I don't just say it very lightly, there are good things happening in Durham. And when we say that we're talking about at an early age, 
identification prevention is critical, and Durham has decided let's address some of those components and let's see how do we raise and support our children being healthy at an early age and not waiting until they are older. The relationships with Durham um, Public Schools have increased immensely, so we should be extremely proud of that. We have children and students transitioning to healthy human beings, adults, and that is done only because you made the investment as leaders of Durham to do that. So thank you for your support, continued support. Thank you. Thank you. Scuffing. Gaddy. Present. As many of you know, this is Police Week and Peace Officers of Memorial Day. And I'd like to present this to Captain Gaddy, who, Gaddy, who's the Vice President of Fraternal Order of Police. Whereas the Congress and President of the United States have designated May the 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which it falls as National Police Week, whereas the officers of Durham County Law Enforcement play an essential role safeguarding the rights and freedom of the citizens of Durham, Whereas it is important that our citizens are aware of and understand the dangers and problems encountered and the duties and responsibilities incurred by their law enforcement officers. Whereas it is equally important that our law enforcement officers recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, protecting them against violence or disorder, and protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression or intimidation. Whereas the men and women of Durham County law enforcement unceasingly provide a vital public service now, therefore, I, William V. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim this week, the week of May 15th through May 21st, 2017, as Police Week, and April 28th, 2017, as Peace Officers Memorial Day in Durham, and call upon our citizens to join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who have rendered a dedicated service to their community. I encourage our citizens to attend the Peace Officers Memorial Day service which was on April 28th at 11 a.m. I was out of town, so I was not able to be there. At Greystone Baptist Church, Hillsborough Road, to the honor, in which they honored the peace officers who lost their lives and have become disabled in the line of duty. Again, what's my hand, Corpus Hill, City of Durham, North Carolina. This was signed on the 20th day of April 2017. And I'd like to present this to you for any comments that you may have. Good evening. It is my pleasure to receive this, and to the mayor, to the man, city manager, the city council, thank you for your continued support of law enforcement in general, but definitely the Fraternal Order of Police. Uh, as we honor officers this month who have died in the line of duty throughout the county of Durham, not just the city, but city and county, um, I would ask you to continue to keep them and their families in your prayers as they made the ultimate sacrifice. Um, to our uh, city council members um, that attended and those who had desire to attend the um, service, thank you. We appreciate that as well. Councilman Davis, thank you for presenting the proclamation to our Chief of Police, Chief Davis. Thank you for the inspirational message that you provided to us uh, during the ceremony. Also, I'd like to thank the Hillside High School Chorus who rendered the music, which was just unbelievable. It's amazing to see what those young folks can do as kids and young adults um, and the type of service that they provided. And also, we'd like to thank the Greystone Baptist Church for providing the facility that we have had the uh, opportunities to host again and sit back and enjoy. And so, um, you know, I ask you and I ask everyone here, just remember to keep the officers in your prayers as we get out there every day in, day out, to provide you the service as best possible service that we could possibly provide. Thank you. Uh, the final proclamation recognizes audit services, and I'd like to ask Jermaine Bruinton, who's the director of our audit services department, if she would join me. Uh, whereas internal auditing is a vital part of strengthening organizations and protecting stakeholders of both the public and private sectors, whereas internal auditing helps identify and manage the organization's risks and ensure policies, procedures, and controls are in place and working appropriately, whereas internal auditing is an increasingly sophisticated and complex activity 
requiring specialized knowledge, training, and education, whereas internal auditing is an established profession led by the Institute of Internal Auditors with a globally recognized code of ethics and international standards for the professional practice of internal auditing, whereas the contribution of internal auditors to the success of organizations and the global economy at large deserves our recognition and commendations. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bell Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of May 8, 2017, as Internal Audit Week in Durham and commend its observance to our citizens. And again, with my hand, the Corporate Civil City of Durham this is the first day of May 2017. And I'd like to present this to Jermaine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, for your continued support. Um, the mission of the Audit Services Department is to provide assurance that city processes are working efficiently and effectively, and we do that every day. But once a year, we get to sponsor Internal Audit Week. Uh, Internal Audit Week will begin next Monday, uh, Monday, May the 8th, and during that week, we'll have several fun and engaging activities to augment other city trainings to city employees for, uh, for fraud prevention and fraud awareness. And so we invite city council members, we invite our colleagues, other city staff, and, and city residents. If you're in City Hall next week, please stop by and participate in the uh, activities that will be taking place. So we thank you very much. Let me ask other comments by members of the council. Recognize the mayor pro tem. Good evening. Um, mayor Bell, I request your excuse absence from the meeting on Thursday. I haven't uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities board meeting. It's been brought from moving second. I should have announced that the voting machine is still not working. Uh, the plan is to have it uh, installed sometime after July. Uh, having said that, uh, entertain a motion on the item. All in favor of the motion and keep saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. I'll recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, May is um, Durham Bike Month, and uh, this kicks off a series of events throughout the city during the month of May uh, designed to encourage folks to get out of their cars, get off the couch, get on the bike, and ride around this beautiful city. Um, bike Month kicked off for earlier this evening at Ponysaurus Brewing Company uh, for an event uh, where you could uh, ride your bike over, have it tuned up by some of the local experts from the bike co-op, um, and uh, meet other folks who are interested in cycling. I've managed to uh, rouse myself and, and bike over there uh, from City Hall, but uh, still uh, actually got on a bike today, which was, uh, hadn't happened in a long time. And uh, my bike was in horrible shape, so the tune-up was much needed, and I got a list of things I need to get replaced. Um, needless to say, it was a fun time, although I was unable to fully enjoy the brewery because of our evening together, Mr. Mayor. But um, uh, in any event, I just wanted to highlight that. If folks are interested in learning more about Durham Bike Month, they can go to durhambikemonth.org, um, where, th where there is a list of events. Uh, all sorts of things are happening uh, throughout the city uh, in regard to Bike Month. There are different uh, events to go to, um, group rides and that sort of thing. So I encourage folks to uh, go to that website, durhambikemonth.org, and get out uh, and bike in the city of Durham. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can I ask Councilman Shule and Councilman Moffitt? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just want to uh, remind uh, the council and uh, tell the folks in Durham at large that Durham Refugee Day will be celebrated this Saturday, May the 6th, from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock at Durham Central Park. And we will have uh, uh, refugee families who are cooking, and we will have music. And everyone in Durham is invited to come embrace the refugee families that we have living in Durham. It's, this, is a, this is an event that's been endorsed by the city of Durham, but it is also being sponsored by our two refugee resettlement agencies, World Relief Durham and Church World Service, who are resettling refugee families here in Durham and giving them support. Uh, so if you can come out on Saturday, it's going to be a lot of fun, Durham Central Park, between 2 o'clock and 5 o'clock. And look forward to seeing a lot of folks there. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Steve. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, thank you. Um, one of the fun things that I like about my work is uh, getting out into the community 
um, and seeing the work that other people are doing. And Saturday was, I just had a lot of fun on Saturday. Um, I started with the Lisa P. Angels uh, 5K, where um, the Chestnut family is, has really made this 5K come together in order to provide information to the community on health, in particular on diabetes. And um, then I went over to the, uh, there was a, a work session of the Women's Commission working on issues related to women. But the one that was most remarkable to me was the Coalition for Unchained Dogs, which was over in East Durham, and it's now gone on to become Beyond Fences. And I learned, and, and this is what I didn't know, I'm embarrassed that I didn't know, how much work they've been doing over the last 10 years for people who are typically low income, and um, they're just people helping people with their really loved pets. They've built over 2,000, they've fenced 2,000 yards in the last 10 years. They've helped 4,500 dogs and the people that those dogs go with. They help people who have to give up their pets and connect them to people who are looking for pets. They've provided beyond, uh, beyond fences, they've provided shade, straw, and even crates to help people when they want to transition their dogs inside. They give them information. They help them with spay, and they hold spay, regular spay and neuter clinics and provide vaccinations. And uh, the event was filled with all the people who have been helped by the organization. And everyone, when everybody I talked to was just wildly enthusiastic about the, the connections that were being made between people uh, over this work and their pets. And I just was, want to give a shout out to Beyond Fences. Well, uh, I was in Washington for the better part of the week, but I got back in time to uh, partake of some of the Auto Cool events. And uh, it, was, it was a great weekend, uh, a lot of energy in the downtown area. And Sister and her team would be congratulated for putting on what I thought was a, a great show, a great event. Uh, having said that, I'm going to recognize the city Mr. manager. Mr. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do, I do want to say, and I wasn't out there by myself, there were other council members who were at all these events, and I'm afraid to start naming them because I'll forget somebody who was at one of them or another. But um, I know, um, thank you for bringing up Arctic Cool, but um, everybody was out. I know a lot of people were in, in the community, so thank you. Thanks, Darn. Recognize Deputy City Manager Wanda Page, 20 priority items. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. I have no priority items this evening. And, uh, Assistant Deputy, the City Attorney tonight. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Senior Assistant City Attorney Kimberly Rayberg and the City Attorney's Office also has no priority items tonight. Thank you. Uh, likewise, City Clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Okay. We'll proceed with the agenda, consent agenda being the first item. Uh, if a person chooses to pull an item, a council member pulls an item. We'll discuss that later in the meeting. Uh, and I'll read the head of each one. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is dependent eligibility, eligibility verification performance audit, March 2017. Item three is request to amend other grant and capital project ordinances. Item four is EB 4707B, Old Durham Chapel Hill Road Bicycle and Pedestrian Facility Supplemental Agreement. Item five is the downtown loop water line replacement and water meter upgrades. Amendment two with Kimberly Horn and Associates Inc. Item six is construction manager at risk contract with Gilbane Building Company for the Miss Lake facility expansion and South Durham Water Reclamation Facility Laboratory Building Project. Item seven is Central Park water line replacement construction contract with J.F. Wilkinson Contracting Company Inc. Item eight is turnage heights lift station abandonment Mud Creek outfall project. Item nine is Federal Road lift station and force main upgrade contract award to CDM Smith Inc. Item 10 is on call professional services for construction administration and construction of observation contract award. Item 11 is cooperative purchase group purchase fire truck for the Durham Fire Department. Item 12 is the bid report for March 2017. Item 13 is refunding of general obligation bonds, series 2007, and issuance of general obligation two-thirds bonds. <coughs> Item 14 is proposed acquisition of approximately 26.7 acres of vacant land 
a portion of 78 acres located at 5510 Wake Forest Highway, Durham County, NC, parcel number 193738, for construction of a new southeast regional lift, lift station. Item 15 is amendment to Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, Adult and Dislocated Worker Services with Educational Data Systems Incorporated, EDSI, from July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2017. Item 16 is agreement to fund MOGFest for FY 2016-2017. Item 17 is a resolution supporting the conveyance of property located at 1228 Carroll Street to the City of Durham. Item 18 is the utility extension agreement with Farrington Apartments LP to serve Farrington mixed use. Item 19 is license agreement with Alexander Industrial Park Associates LLC for a sign within the public right of way. Item 20 is a resolution to support the Upper Noose River Basin Association FY 2018 budget and City of Durham contribution. Item 23 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda. Item 24 is an item that can be found on the general business agenda as a public hearing. I entertain a motion for approval of consent agenda items. Second. Improper move and second. All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. We move to item 24, general business agenda, public hearings, consolidated annexation for Grove Field, Fielding, Yancey property. Is there a staff member on this item? Thank you. Good evening. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. I'm an annexation petition, utility extension agreement application, and zoning map change requests has been received from SBT Joint Venture, LLC, for 47-acre parcel located at 7218 Leesville Road. Um, the subject site that is being petitioned for annexation would create a new satellite annexation. The closest contiguous city limit is approximately 1,200 linear feet to the west of the subject site. The site is presently zoned residential rural airport overlay in the county's jurisdiction, and the applicant is requesting a zoning designation of Plan Development Residential 3.170 Airport Overlay in the city's jurisdiction. If approved, the annexation and zoning map change will become effective on June 30th, 2017. The development plan associated with this request um, commits to a number of items. Some key commitments include um, limiting the development to a maximum of 149 single-family residential units with a minimum lot size of 3,500 square feet construction of an east to west collector street for site access points, roadway improvements along Leesville Road, and project boundary buffers. The Planning Commission recommended approval of this rezoning request by a vote of 10 to 1 at their January 10th, 2017 meeting, and staff determines that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted policies and ordinances, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask first for the questions, comments by members of the council on this item. If not, we have one person that has signed up to speak. Uh, while Gerard Eddings is coming here, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item? Uh, if you don't mind, if you could go to the clerk's table to the left and turn your card in. And wh why are you, are you speaking in support or against? Okay. Uh, you have three minutes initially. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jared Edens with Edens Land Corp. I'm here representing my client, uh, James Tucker. Um, as Jacob summarized, we're here um, requesting support uh, for our 149 lot subdivision uh, off Leesville Road near Briar Creek in Durham. Uh, as you're well aware, this is a fast-growing part of town. Uh, the Del Webb project spurned development here several years ago, and then uh, you've seen many projects pop up around it, taking advantage of the extension of utilities and whatnot in the great location. Uh, we think this project will fit right in. We're proposing a density that's well within the future land use plan. Uh, we've had a fairly smooth process uh, so far, knock on a really big piece of wood as I stand here tonight. Uh, but I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Are there any questions of the developer at this time? If not, I uh, recognize Mr. Strother. Uh, you signed up for two. Is Anthony and Rosemarie, are both of you speaking?
So um, this kind of caught us off guard because we were expecting notification um, for a follow-up meeting that we had um, with the planning commission. With the planning commission um, just a zoning change. Yeah, just a um, what? Zoning change. Right. But not a city annex. Yeah, not a city annex. No um, yeah. Yeah, we didn't know it was part of the overall plan that this was going to happen. We were expecting a follow-up from a meeting where there was a few months ago for where there was a discussion about possible changes to um, roads coming out of the development that would impact us. Um, the one that the, they want four feeder roads coming out of the development. And actually, there, there would only be two in actuality because one would be go to Leesville Road. The other one, there's property behind them farm, so it doesn't, it wouldn't reach Shady Grove Road. And then the next one on the south side is to Bluegrass Road. And then the other one's to a, to a farm where they said eventually Briar Creek Parkway is going to come up through there to connect to Leesville Road. The one we object to is to the one coming out on Bluegrass Road because it's a little bitty gravel tarred road that is a dead end. And if they all of a sudden put a road there, when people are coming from 70 or Briar Creek, they cut through Shady Grove Road, hit the four-way red light intersection, they're going to try to cut down bluegrass. And so our traffic on that corner is going to explode because the one paper said there's there they estimated like 910 vehicles traffic a day in and out of that subdivision that they're going to put in there. Yeah. That road will not take that much traffic. I mean, it's we're right on the corner of Shady Grove and Bluegrass, and our road's full of potholes just from the dump trucks from the, they're building a house down the street. It just, it doesn't seem feasible that it's going to, for them to put a road on that side. And there's also supposed to be a, I don't know how big an acre, but where there's a wood line against Bluegrass Road and where they're going to build the subject, they can't touch. So in essence, they're going to have to cut through a section of that. Okay, let me, hold on, let me see. So I just want to add to that that I think there needs to be better notification to the folks who live in the area that are going to be affected of this other than a letter that comes out saying it's, it's one thing and you get here and you find out looking at the agenda that it's something totally different and going to the county's website trying to find information is just horrendous to try to do that. So thank you. Yeah, we didn't know it was going to get annexed to the city. I mean, that's like in our backyard, and it's just not right. Could I ask a question, please? Could I ask, could I ask a question of you? Sure. All right, you say you live at the corner of Bluegrass and Shady Grove. Uh, yeah. Do you have the little map? That's what I'm looking at now. Is there any way we can put the map up for this item? Yeah, so we were expecting another discussion about that and no idea that this was going to go to this point. So are, are you telling me the letter didn't have anything in it about annexation? Mm -hmm. No. no. Is, it just is that said correct? about zoning. It just said about zoning. We get here and we look at, oops, we look at the list of items on the thing, and that's where it says annexation to the city of Durham. Do, do we have a copy of the letter that was sent out from the staff? Mr. Mayor, members of Council, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Uh, Mr. Wiggins can provide the certification. He, he has reviewed that material today on the notification. We, we believe all notifications made as required by law. Uh, we can pull it here in just a moment and, and confirm okay. uh, that the, the speakers are on that list. Mr. Young, is notification required for um, annexations? The, the notification um, references the zoning action, which is what's required by law. Um, the annexation's got a, a, a separate uh, notification area, so again, I'd want to have Mr. Wiggins confirm the exact location of the uh, speaker's property. Right here. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is ours right here. 
Yeah, and Jacob Williams of the Planning Department, um, just to follow up on what Director Young said, that yes, I, I can affirm that um, public notice was sent in accordance with applicable laws and policies for this request. The initial zoning designation is 100 feet from the subject site. So the, the larger range is the zoning map change application, which goes to a radius of 600 feet. The letter would have had both case numbers on there for this request with contact information for staff for additional information regarding these well, actions. It had two case numbers, but oh, so could, could, I, could I ask another question? Yes. Can you tell me what is your understanding as a result of the Planning Commission report? After the Planning Commission report, we, I thought I, I heard you say. I was the impression that the next meeting we were going to attend would be to discuss possible changes that we talked about previously about this outlet road connecting to the small road we live off of um, and other discussions leading up to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Other discussions leading up to that, and then we would eventually end up being before this group for some sort of final approval or something based on all that. I didn't know that this was going to happen, and then what another portion. Who, who, who led you to believe that you were supposed to have those discussions? That was part of the discussion when we were here last time. They said we were going to have. And a pub, you're talking about the planning commission. Yes, sir. And I'm saying, what? I don't remember the name of the person that that I did, that we had this part of the discussion with. Well, l let me tell you what my my issue. My issue isn't really with the zoning matter. My issue is really have we given proper notification to persons sure. that are being impacted. Uh, and I, I know that's a legal way, but I, I still, yeah. I'm a little surprised that if you're going to annex some property that people next to it aren't a part of that notification. Yeah. If there was another letter that went out, it sure didn't make it to our home because we've gotten all the other ones and made all the meetings that we could make that were scheduled. So it just sort of took us off guard that we're at this point already. And being that Dur the property is going to be annexed to Durham City probably doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things, you know, other than it's going to be part of Durham City and we're still in part of Durham County, but it still would be nice to have that spelled out something clear in black and white that we could look at as living next to this property that says, hey, oh, by the way, when you come to this meeting, this is what that's going to be discussed. The city's going to be right across the street from you. We already have the city of Raleigh right across the street on the other side of Shady Grove and now the city of Durham, we, which we thought would be further up 70, is now coming all the way to almost to the end of the county line. Well, you, you've raised two questions. You've raised the question about notification, but you've also raised the question about the road. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's what I'd like the staff to speak to. Sure. Jacob Wiggins with the Piney Department. Um, staff can certainly look at our letter notifications to see if we need to provide some additional information in terms of the initial zoning. I apologize if that wasn't clear. Um, we certainly want to provide clear and concise information. Um, in regards to the roadway connection, it is a requirement of the ordinance for the applicant to connect to that street to the south of the property. Um, and I believe that has, is why it is currently shown as is on the development plan. Part of one of those discussions that we had in here the last meeting with the other folks was that to go back and look at this because it really didn't make sense even though the rules for doing all the development state that Durham County, the development plan, says they want access on all four points, points of the compass. And the discuss, part of the discussion was it really didn't make, act, make sense common sense to have a road come in to access this little dinky road we live off of when it really serves no purpose other than just to fulfill something that's in black and white and an ordinance for development. Oh no, they said that they needed those point access for emergency vehicles, for their access, for easy access to get into that subject. Well, uh, Durham volunteer Bethesda Fire Department's right across the street. There is no way they're going to come down Shady Grove, come down Bluegrass to come up the back end. You know, they're, everybody's going to go off of Leesville Road to get into that subdivision. So that, that's, you know, another reason that I was thinking is like, why would they go around when they're right there across the street to go be able to go in off of Leesville Road? But that's part of the, the they called it the UDO ordinance that says has to have four points. Well, 
that might be well and good, but they need to look at the plot of land and see exactly where stuff is and how traffic would go or emergency crews would go around to get into that, access to that development, and make sense out of it. You know, right now it doesn't make sense for the way that parcel's positioned and the roads that are around it. So if I have any response to that, was there an alternative? Sure. Um, um, so the applicants, or I'm sorry, um, the neighbors are correct. The ordinance does require these four connections. Um, there's two ordinance standards um, being triggered by this request. One is that since the applicant is proposing more than 91 dwelling units, they have to provide two connections to the existing roadway network. There's one on Leesville Road, and the second one here um, to the south of the property is the second one. The, there's also a linear dimension that the ordinance requires. So any side of a property in, a, in the suburban tier that is greater than 1,400 feet in length, the applicant also has to provide potential stub outs along those sides. Um, and you can see that those are shown on the eastern side of the subject property. And the applicant is also showing the east-west collector street on the internal portion of the property. Um, this was a, a point of discussion at the Planning Commission meeting. Um, and it's a pretty black and white standard of the Unified Development Ordinance for, the, uh, for these connections. You, you're meeting the requirements of the ordinance? Yes, the plans as personally designed do meet the requirements of the ordinance. Okay, let me ask other, other questions. you have other comments you want to make? Um, no, sir. And here I have the original letter that, that we got saying about the, you know, this meeting being about the zoning and nothing about the annexation. But we're across the street, but I know neighbors who also border that property, and I don't know if they got a notification or not because they didn't hear about the one at the Planning Commission. They had no idea. So I don't know if they got a letter for this one. Well, my, my, my comfort level would be if proper notification was not given. Right. And there was no signs or nothing posted even around saying that there was going to be a public meeting about this property. Well, they don't post signs like that. They oh, do okay. post signs about whether the, there's a zoning ordinance coming up. And I'm, I'm hearing from the staff that you gave the proper legal notification these persons were yeah mr mayor member members of council pat young again with the planning department i can certify that notice was required you say uh, you can i can certify that notice was required provided as required by law the property was posted with the sign and notification of the annexation and zoning was provided there are different notification areas under state law and so there may have been you may have received a notice for one but not the other but that is possible but as mr wiggins referred to um the case number well, along with all contact information uh, and a description of the actions being taken is in the letter. So I, I'm not sure that uh, even if you had received the proper letter that you would have liked to have seen, the issue that you really are coming for pertains to the road. That's, that's what the real issue is. Yes. And I'm understanding from the staff that legally they're required to, the developers required to provide a road at this site and I don't know if there's, have you, have you a better suggestion? As, you don't want a road period. Is that your well, So part of the discussion, well, I would prefer not to have a road period because sure. it just makes no sense. I understand, but what, what about an alternative? Uh, part of the discussion we had with the gentleman here. Can, can you get a closer to the mic, oh, I'm mic please? I hate microphones. Part of the discussion we had when we were here last time was, was put a road, so put a gravel road at, at a certain point coming towards the bluegrass road, the output onto the road we live off of, and just put a gate there, and the only folks that could get through the road would fulfill the commitment according to the ordinance. There would actually be a road there, but for emergency vehicles only, and put a gate there or some sort of access that only emergency vehicle folks could get in through, so that when the folks who live in the development, if the road was completed all the way through as originally planned, wouldn't start dumping out on the little road we live off of and make life even more chaotic than it currently is. That makes sense. It makes sense, but the question is, is it doable? Is the developer willing to, to adhere to something right. like that? And would that be something that the staff could accept? And that was you, you're trying to protect your interests. I understand that. Yes, that's that's what people that, come this up This is what I understood that we were coming to this next okay. meeting for. There would be sometime in February, but now it's May. 
Okay, let the staff comment on that. Then I'm going to, if there are any further comments, I'm going to close sure. the public hearing. Uh, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, it, the connection is more than just for emergency connection. It also helps to alleviate traffic associated with the proposed development. Um, the reason we have the standards and the ordinance to direct traffic, you know, to have multiple roadway connection points is based upon the number of trips generated by a project. So to, in this case, the impact it would be slightly lessened on Leesville, and yes, there may be some additional traffic in the um, neighborhood where these uh, folks live. Um, outside of that, um, I, I think the only other option for the applicant could be to theoretically go back through the process, request a variance from the Durham Board of Adjustment to get out of that commitment. Um, in doing so, it, it would result in the request going back to Planning Commission and ultimately back before this body. Jared, did you hear that? <laughs> you, who was that head question? Steve? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, I did, and I appreciate Jacob's summary. And just, I appreciate, we've, I've been working on this property for like three years, so we've, with different developers, different, I've gotten to know the neighbors over the years, we understand the concern, but I think in the grand scheme of things, because I'm also working on all the property west of here and the Briar Creek extension and all the things, if you want to go to Raleigh or go to Briar Creek or go to Durham in the grand scheme of things, because I've driven down Bluegrass Lane, you're going to go west and have your easy access to Briar Creek Parkway extension, which is under construction right now. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think our neighbors to the south are going to see a lot of extra traffic when things develop out. Um, that being said, we're just not in a position to propose anything right now that changes the development plan that's before you tonight. So I understand the concerns, but we would ask for consideration of what we have. Thank you. That's Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, I understand the concerns of the residents and I, I'm sh I know they're legitimate. You live there and you wish there wasn't going to be more traffic. And there is going to be some more traffic and I can understand why you feel that way. But I also do think that it's important that we not have a, a um, you know, what would effectively at this point uh, be a, a development with uh, just at first just one outlet. Uh, I, I think that connectivity is important as, as is, and, you know, having multiple outlets for a fairly large tract like this, as well as uh, the emergency vehicles. I don't think that's the only concern. But I do I understand where you're coming from. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that given where we are, um, that I, I can't see another way around that. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Edens a question, if you don't mind. Uh, Sir, as you know, um, uh, we've uh, got uh, affordable housing needs in our community, and one of the th good things about adding housing is that it'll help us meet our demands. We also have an affordable housing need, and I wondered if you had considered uh, a proffer to our uh, city's affordable housing fund as, uh, as, a, as a commitment. Yes, yeah, so we've... Um Thank you for the question, Mr. Shul. I've had a conversation with my client. Um, and just a little background, I've, I know some of the numbers. I know this is fairly new. I guess some of these proffers are fairly new. So I don't know what the numbers are based on, the numbers that, that I've heard. I have an idea in my head. Keep in mind that this parcel is going to be paying approximately six hundred to $700,000 in utility sewer basin fees directly to the city of Durham as part of its development. Um, which is just something to take into consideration for cost to my, to my client. We would proffer what would basically equates to $100 per unit, which would be a $15,000 payment to that fund. Uh, I tried to come up with a number. That's just what I came up with, to be honest with you. That okay. would be our proffer tonight. And so uh, can I ask the staff uh, in terms of what, what do you need? Uh, thank you, Council Member Shul uh, and members of Council. We're certainly willing to accept and, and we can enforce that commitment. We would ask for a timing mechanism and we would ask that that be uh, uh, prior to first preliminary plat. Yeah. First, first, first final plat recording. Correct. That's acceptable also. Thank you. Similar to the school's payment. Sure. Thank you. 
Thank you. And uh, also, Mr. Edens, uh, you're adding 11 students with this rezoning. Um, it's customary for applicants to proffer a donation of $500 per student to the Durham Public Schools, which in this case would be $5,500. Have you considered this proffer? Yes, sir. We would gladly do that. Again, to be made payment made prior to first final plat for the project. Thank you. Jacob Wiggensville, Pioneer Department. Staff sees no issue in enforcing that proffered commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Eaton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We ask are there other questions? Recognize Councilman Reese. Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to speak briefly to the residents who came tonight. Um, I wanted to say that I think uh, the rules that we have uh, in within the UDO for road access exist for a reason. Um, and I think my colleague, Councilmember Shul, has spoken to, that, Shul has spoken to those reasons uh, pretty, pretty adequately tonight. I did also want to say, though, that uh, even if I, I read the, the written comments from the Planning Commission, and a number of them did express uh, or did echo your concerns about uh, that, that roadway and what well, that would do to traffic on the south end of the uh, proposed development. Um, and they asked us, I believe one of them asked us to explore whether or not that particular requirement needed to be enforced in this instance. I will tell you that the problem with not enforcing that requirement in this instance is that developers will then uh, come to us and say, well, you didn't enforce it in the other instance. Why are you enforcing it with our development? And they would have a very powerful, uh, both uh, rhetorical but also legal argument against us if we try to enforce it later. Um, I say that not because I think that will help you feel better about what's coming for your neighborhood but only to help you understand why I personally uh, will be voting for the development plan tonight or for the, uh, for the rezoning and the, and, the, um, and the annexation is because I see no good way for us to keep this from going forward um, on the basis that you've, you've asked us to. Um, and I wanted to explain a little bit about my own vote and why I, I plan to do that um, and just to say that I, I wish there was some other way we could handle it tonight, but I believe this is what we're going to do. So thank you. Let me ask the other comments by the members of the council. Uh, let me ask if anyone else that wants to speak on this item that's been a public hearing matter. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes ma'am. If this all goes through and there is an access to bluegrass, what plans are going to be to improve Bluegrass Road? Because it's a barely a two lane gravel road you know, that's just tarred over. I mean, it's full of potholes right now, but if they have continued traffic on there, that's not going to stand up. You know, it, it, it's not a viable road that would stand up under all that traffic. So if this happens, then what kind of improvements are going to happen on to bluegrass? Let, let, let me ask the staff, is, is the road, will bluegrass be a part of the annexation or is it outside the annexation? Uh, Mr. Mayor, that's a good question. That would not be part of the annexation, but what I can verify and what, what uh, Mr. Judge was able to verify for us was that Bluegrass Road is indeed a state-maintained road, so it would be maintained to state standard. And as is very common with state roads, when there's increased traffic, they evaluate it for improvements. And it, it, it is paved, ribbon paved. Uh, it's, it's not gravel. It is two-lane. Uh, it's about 30 feet curb to curb. Uh, so a pretty standard road for that part of the county. Uh, Mr. Judge may want to speak to the future, any future plans um, for improvements to that roadway or adjacent roadways. Yeah, uh, Bill Judge with transportation, the applicant would be required to um, get permits from NCDOT to provide that connection. I suspect that DOT would likely require some bonds, um, particularly if there's going to be any construction traffic accessing the site from, from bluegrass to ensure that if the road gets torn up or further damaged by the construction activities that it would be repaired by the by the developer and applicant. But short of that, there's no um, city or county requirement to make improvements to bluegrass since it is an existing state-maintained roadway. Okay, well, let, let me suggest this. Uh, are, do you have other questions before I close the public hearing? Uh, if anyone else wants to speak, this being a public hearing. Uh, if not, uh, the public hearing is closed and matters back before the council. And before we vote on this item, which it's obvious it's, it's going to pass, uh, I would ask Jarrett if you would consider what's been said about the condition of the road and your obligation uh, to NCDOT to get the road in good shape. 
And I guess the next step would be, uh, Steve, if you're on the MPO, when we come back through the MPO, that could be one of the roads that we could ask for consideration as a part of that. Uh, having said that, I'm going to call a question on the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Uh, all in favor of the motion, they kept it saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. The consistent cessation. It's been properly moved and second. All in favor of the motion in the case of saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, that concludes that item. Is there anything else that needs to come before the council this time? Oh, sorry about that. She's been sitting there all that time. You thought you would get away when I said that, right? No. How did I miss that? Okay. Sorry about that. You're wrong on that one. Oh, it's okay. It's part of the job. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <laughs> Tonight I bring to you the first quarter report for 2017. Uh, the quarterly report will cover the department's six performance measures, part one index crime, violent crime, property crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls. In addition, tonight the department's analytical services manager uh, Jason Sheese will also provide a brief overview of DPD stop data captured during the 2016 calendar year. Additional statistics and highlights are found in the written document that you've been provided. Part one crime consists of violent crime plus property crime. Overall, part one crime was up by 7% in the first quarter. Crime was down in homicides and burglaries. Much of the increase was driven by a rise in robbery, robberies and larcenies. Larcenies make up more than half of all part one crimes. Violent crime was up by 9%, driven largely by a 24% increase in robberies. The new robbery task force continues to focus on commercial robberies and robberies committed with firearms. Inve investigators work closely with the department crime analysts and other seasoned investigators from federal entities, the DA's office, and federal prosecutors, other agencies. Since November, the robbery task force has been assigned 367 cases through April 15th. Many of their arrests are detailed in the accompanying first quarter report. We began several initiatives during the first quarter to target violent crime. To name a few, District 1 held a supplemental patrol operation focusing on robberies in the area of the Village Shopping Center. Officers participated in more than 450 foot and director patrols and made numerous contacts with businesses and citizens. Robberies have dropped by more than a half in the area and no robberies occurred during the supplemental patrol hours. District 2 conducted an operation focusing on robberies in the North Duke Street, North Roxborough Street, Horton Road areas, which has had positive results as well. District 3 held an operation focusing on robberies in several apartment complexes near Durham Chapel Hill Boulevard. District 4 held Operation Ceasefire to focus on violent crimes in various areas of District 4. There were seven actual homicides during the first quarter. Three of the homicides have been cleared by arrest. Arrests were also made in two homicides that occurred in 2017. The UCR chart that you see shows four homicides reported during the first quarter, but there were actually seven. So the chart is not playing tricks on you there. Three were cleared as self-defense in 2006-17, which under UCR guidelines, they count 
four and they take those three off. But we keep track of both UCR guidelines and also what we actually experienced in 2017. 27% of robberies during the first quarter were commercial with one bank robbery. 63% of all reported robberies were committed with firearms. The number of aggravated assault victims, which is counted by victims, as well as the number of actual incidents went up slightly, approximately 1% during this quarter. During the first quarter of 2017 compared to the first quarter of 2016, 45% of all first quarter 2017 aggravated assaults involve multi-victim firearm incidents. Same as the 2016 first quarter period. Burglaries continue to trend downward. We had the fewest first quarter burglaries in at least 17 years. The increase in property crime was driven by a rise in reported larcenies, which accounted for 55% of all Part 1 crime during the first quarter. There was an increase in the number of reported larcenies from vehicles. Officers and investigators conducted awareness initiatives to target and combat these type larcenies during the first quarter. Again, in many cases, people left items such as purses, computers, or phones in plain view in their vehicles. Motor vehicle thefts were also up during the first quarter slightly. Here's a breakdown of property crime categories. 80% of all burglaries were residential. Of course, burglaries down by 4%. Most stolen items in burglaries included television sets, electronics, computer equipment, and tools. 28% of larcenies involved shoplifting, which was the same during the first quarter of 2016. The most stolen items in larcenies included phones, money, purses, jewelry, and computer equipment. Honda Accords continue to be the most stolen vehicles. Approximately 25% of stolen vehicles had the engines running, keys left in the vehicle when they were stolen, which is a higher percentage than in the first quarter of 2016, which was 17%. This chart was created by our Crime Analysis Unit to illustrate the weekly trends of Part 1 violent crimes during the first quarter. So the blue line represents 2017 violent, Part 1 violent crime, and the red line represents property crime. As you can see, Part 1 crimes have been trending downward. The year-to-date comparison illustrates a sharp rise in the beginning of January, peaking about the fourth week of January, then a dramatic drop over the first two weeks of February and a steady decline through March and early April. Our executive team here continues to discuss crime trends every week at our crime abatement meetings in depth. That's where we decide on new strategies, implement best practices, and sometimes recalibrate our current action plans for more optimal outcomes. Clearance rates. During the first quarter, the Durham Police Department's clearance rates were above the FBI clearance rates for similar sized cities in rape, robbery, larceny, and part one property crimes. The first column captures clearance rates for only the first quarter. DPD annual clearance rates are in the second, um, second column for 2016, and then the FBI 2015 clearance rates are in the far right column. 2016 clearance rates for the FBI are not available at this particular time. The FBI clearance rates are for cities the size of Durham with populations of 100,000 to 250,000 residents. Officer response times. Our target for responding to calls for service is 57% of property priority one calls in under five minutes. 
This quarter, 54.1% were under five minutes. This is an improvement, slight improvement for 2016 when 51%, 51.2% were under five minutes. Our target response time per call is 5.8 minutes as an average. The average response times was 6.8 minutes during the first quarter. This is an improvement over 2016 when the average response times was 6.3 minutes. We had a 10% increase in priority one calls for service during the first quarter of 2017 over the first quarter of 2016. The number of priority one calls was up 32% from 2014 through 2016. Our increased supplemental patrols and the new slide units allow us to assign additional officers when and where we need them most. Staffing. Sworn staffing at the end of, fir of the first quarter was at 91% with 48 vacancies. A BLET class of 11 graduated in February during this quarter. Our current BLET class started in February and has 21 recru recruits who are well beyond the critical phases of their training. We started our first ALEC class, in first one in five years on April 17th with six officers. This hiring strategy provides a faster way to get experienced officers on the street. Our recruiting unit has been heavily involved in robust uh, recruiting campaign. They tested 132 recruits during the first quarter, which is more than double the number, which was 64 that were tested the first quarter of last year. We plan to hold a BLET class starting this summer and hope to have at least 30 recruits in that class. Non-sworn staffing was at 86% with 17 vacancies at the end of the first quarter. That remains the same now. So first quarter updates. First, I want to talk about the body cameras and I'm really going to spend more time with that. More than 150 body-worn cameras have been deployed. All officers in District 1, 2, and 4 have been trained and outfitted. More than 20,000 videos have been uploaded. Body camera survey was conducted. We put together a quick survey for our citizens just so that we could sort of test out what their feelings were about our body cameras and having that equipment on our officers. The glaring response out of uh, the questions that were asked, it was approximately six questions. The one that was glaring was that more than 90% of the individuals that were encountered by the officers didn't know the officers had on a camera. So there's going to be more training on communicating the fact that I'm recording this particular incident. 75% said the body-worn cameras increase their trust in the police department. More than 90% said all officers should wear the cameras. And almost 95% said they were comfortable with their interactions being recorded. The remaining respondents neither agreed nor disagreed. More than 85% believed the cameras would have a positive effect resulting in respectful behavior by both police officers and community members during police encounters. Only two people disagree with that. We plan to expand the body worn camera survey citywide during the duration of the implementation process as well and have those, uh, that, those reports and that data for you. We received author authorization recently to go ahead and deploy our additional 28 take home vehicles that should be occurring within the next, working really close with fleet, and that should be occurring within the next 30 days. Community engagement. The department participated in various community engagement activities. Uh, we participated in the Police Reads program with the uh, Maureen Joy Charter School in March. Um, I enjoyed reading to those students as well in this month. Uh, Y.E. Smith Elementary School will be having a similar program. The inaugural Eagle Award event honoring women in law enforcement was held on March 24th. 
for Women's History Month. The program honored 11 female retired trailblazers in the Durham Police Department and six awards were given to active female law enforcement officers. More details about that award and that ceremony is also in your report. The Durham Police Department reached out to the homeless during the first quarter. One of the images here shows the officers as they presented 10 empowerment coats, which are heavy duty sleeping bags that convert into a warm coat. Officers participated in the point in time homeless count and the Bull City Fresh Start event on January 26. Officer Kendrick Hunter, who is a member of CIT unit, was recently honored as the Durham JC's outstanding young public servant for his work with the homeless and others. And my last slide, our Police Athletic League, the winter basketball season was very successful. 21 youth basketball teams, not 21 youth, but 21 teams, comprised of third through fifth graders, took part in the program during the first quarter. There were 15 participating elementary schools, including boys, girls, and co-ed teams. There were hundreds of children that participated in this tournament. District 4 commanders, investigators, and officers have been hosting community lunches on Tuesday. The next one is tomorrow in McDougal Terrace to build positive relationships with the residents. Officers from North Carolina Central University, Police Department, and the Durham County Sheriff's Office have also participated in these events. We attended and addressed more than 1,000 Hispanic community meetings and others at the Durham CAN uh, meeting. We had a productive conversation and discussed several issues concerning immig immigration and quelling the fear experienced in these vulnerable communities. At this time, I will allow Jason Sheese to go over our stop data and then I'll be available for any questions that you might have. Good evening. Thank you, Chief. Um, as you mentioned, I'm gonna be presenting to you some trend data for our traffic stops over the last seven years. I'm gonna really focus on three major areas, the total quantity of traffic stops, the quantity and ratio of searches that occur as a result of those traffic stops, and then uh, contraband that was located as a result of those searches, also referred to as the hit rate. So to get started, um, as you can see here, over the last seven years, there's been a significant decline in the total number of traffic stops that have occurred in the city of Durham. From 2015 to 2016, there was a 29% reduction, and the total number of stops in 2016 was less than half of what it was in 2010. The demographics of the drivers have remained relatively unchanged over that period. In 2016, 58% of all drivers were black, 39% were white and 11% were Hispanic. In terms of the reason for the stop, vehicle equipment and regulatory violations are a bit of a marker. We have seen a reduction in how represented those are among stops as to the reason. So in, in 2010, 39% of all of the traffic stops fit into that category of vehicle regulatory or equipment violations. In 2016, that had dropped to 29% of all stops. So movement violations are more represented, things like running stop, stop lights, stop signs, speeding, and vehicle equipment regulatory, and uh, those types of violations have become less represented. This graph represents the total number of searches by year. Uh, there are several different lines I want to call your attention to. Uh, first of all is the green line, I'm sorry, the, the blue line. That is the total number of consent searches that have occurred. There has been a significant reduction in the number of consent searches, especially since 2013. The red line represents the total number of probable cause searches. There has been an increase in those starting in 2014. So consent searches down, probable cause searches up. 
even though the number of probable cause searches is up, it's not nearly to the, to the degree that consent searches have been reduced. You also notice on the green line, something referred to as multiple search types. Uh, really from 2010 through 2014, there were several hundred of these. Basically, that means that the officer selected more than one type of search on the vehicle traffic stop form. In most cases, that was a combination of both a consent and a probable cause search. We implemented some changes to the computer software in 2015, which eliminated that possibility, requiring the officers to only pick one primary type of search. And as you can see in 2016, we had virtually none of those. This is now the ratio of traffic stops in which a consent search occurred broken down by uh, racial or ethnic uh, demographic. Um, so it's, it's useful in a trend chart to identify if there were any significant changes in policy that occurred during that period. So I'll first call your attention to the fact that in October of 2014, there was such a policy change requiring written consent to search for all consent to searches in vehicles. So what you see here is that this reduction of consent searches over the years, especially from 2013, 14 onwards has been across all of these racial and ethnic groups, black, white, and Hispanic. So the red line representing black drivers, the blue line representing white, and the green representing Hispanic. So for consent searches, the hit rate in 2016 was 14%. In a couple of slides, I'll get a little bit more into what the definition of, of a hit is. That is up from roughly 11% in 2014. Similar graph except for probable cause searches. So this is for, again, uh, the, the racial and ethnic groups of black, white, and Hispanic drivers. And you see that there is an increase for all groups. The rate of that increase is a little bit higher for black drivers than it is for white and Hispanic drivers, but there's an increase across all of those groups. The same policy change is, um, applies to this particular graph. And the hit rate for these types of searches in 2016 was just over 42%, which is a slight reduction from the 45% rate observed in 2014. This graph puts everything, to give, puts everything together and gives you the total percent of stops that resulted in a search for all of these racial and ethnic groups. So consent and probable cause are the most frequent types of searches. There are a couple of other types of searches that are now represented in this data, except they occur at a far fewer amount. Uh, so that would be things like protective frisk, a search incident to arrest, um, and then a search warrant. Those are the other three types of searches that are included in this data. So what you see here is that it has remained relatively consistent, not constant, but consistent across this seven year period. So the rate of search for black drivers in 2016 was higher than it was in two previous years, but lower than it was in four of those years. So roughly in the middle. The purple line represents all groups put together and is the overall rate of search, and that is roughly 5%. So for all types of searches, all groups put together, roughly five out of every 100 driver stops results in some type of a search occurring. I will point out here a couple of things that the rate of search for black drivers is higher than it is for other groups. In 2016, searches with black drivers occurred at a rate 3.38 times higher than that of white drivers. However, the total number of searches reduced dramatically. So as total stops have gone down, so have total searches. So total searches with black drivers in 2016 dropped almost 45% from 2015 to 2016. So a significant reduction even though the rate is still higher than for other groups.
This now represents the result of what those searches, uh, what kind of contraband um, and, and what kind of a hit resulted as a result of those searches. So real quickly, let me define for you what a hit is. Essentially, it is a search in which any type of contraband is located. That could be weapons, it could be alcohol, it could be money, it could be stolen property, it could be drugs. So any type of contraband that is located as a result of a search is included in the hit rate, even if what was found was not the original purpose for the search. So what I mean by that is if there's probable cause to search for drugs and a gun was found, that is still counted as a part of the hit rate because it's contraband. So you'll see here that for all racial and ethnic groups, there has been an increase in that hit rate, especially over the last three years. The overall hit rate in 2016, which is 34.61%, is the highest that it's been over that seven-year period. So what that means is that the searches that are occurring are higher quality searches based upon probable cause. So in summary, traffic stops are down significantly over the last seven years. The overall rate of search has remained relatively constant with a shift from consent towards probable cause searches. That has also resulted in an overall increase in the hit rate for searches, and that has steadily climbed over the last three years. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to the Chief for any questions. Thank you, Jason. And I am available for any questions. I know that was a lot of information. No, and I want to apologize again for skipping over you. That's uh, my fault. Okay. But uh, right. I recognize Councilman Shule, Councilman Davis, Councilman Reese, Councilman Johnson, in that order, and the Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. Is your hand up? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief, Thank you. and uh, sir, for the excellent report on the traffic stops. Um, I mean, you know, the thing about these re re quarterly reports is there's so much to think about in them, yeah. and um, I really appreciate the level of data you provide, uh, including the, not just the PowerPoint, but the longer report. It's very interesting. And, um, and you've commented some on the robberies, which I appreciate. Uh, I, I guess just to start with the body cameras, I do appreciate that you want people to know that the cameras are on. Um, I, you know, I'll, I'll again refer to the Rialto study, which I continue to think is the best study, uh, which uh, cited the importance of people understanding that the camera was on. Uh, that that's a key element in people responding well. Yes. And so I hope that you all will have a protocol that will will be able to work and officers will be accountable for that because I do think that's going to be important if the body cameras are going to get us what we want. Yes, absolutely. Um, the, uh, so the... Um, the traffic stops, I just wanted to say how significant I think this is. Uh, we, and, and we have focused a lot on this in the last couple of years as a city council, uh, Chief, before you arrived. Mm -hmm. We spent a lot of time, we, uh, Chief Marsh especially was very, very involved in this. Uh, we had the, the Veil of Darkness study, but we've had so much work done around this and I think sometimes, you know, we made policy. And sometimes when you make policy, you worry that it's not, you know, n there will be no results. But this is a case where I feel uh, that the policy and the implementation have both really worked. And the, <laughs> the you know, this is a big change. In, in 2011, there were 1,500 total searches. In 2016, 680 total searches, less than half of that number. And the, uh, I think, 44 percent drop in the searches of African Americans is very important. And I just want to thank you and the department for implementing that and doing it so well. It's a big change. Thank you. The, um, 
on page four of the larger report, it talks about one of the things that I noticed is the that uh, the drug violations are down. I'm looking now not at the PowerPoint but at the first quarter report, which in a minute will come up on my iPad. I hope. Okay. Um, and you'll and th this is now I'm referring to uh, the part two offenses. And one of the things I noticed was drug violations in first quarter of 2015, 292, and 16, 314, and 17, only 144. And this really stood out to me, and I didn't, uh, so I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, some things um, seem to be a dilemma, even to us, as we, we look at crime and crime trends. Sometimes we wonder why. Uh, drugs in the area or drug offenses are going down. Um, we celebrate it, of course, but we have been uh, very focused more so on our violent crimes. Not to say that drug activity is not out there. I think they're just more conventional ways of, um, of committing those types of crimes, and not so much in the, in the open or the ability for officers to, to detect it takes um, more concerted, more in-depth, sort of um, behind-the-scenes efforts, long-term investigations, too, in order to impact drug crimes these days. I wonder if it also had something to do with either or both of the traffic stops being down and the perhaps the misdemeanor diversion program as well. I absolutely think that the misdemeanor diversion program, when we think of the numbers of individuals with small amounts of, of marijuana who were at one time arrested, uh, but now moving into a diversion program, I'm sure that that does um, impact those numbers significantly. And of course, traffic stops being down. Um, traffic stops in the past, you know, it's, it's sort of casting a wide net when you set up you know, roadblocks or, you know, um, checkpoints. Of course, traditionally, uh, that was a common practice for law enforcement around the country. And um, there, there are times when uh, you, you could make huge seizures, and then there are times when small amounts of marijuana may have inconvenienced 50 other people in a traffic, st in, in, in a traffic checkpoints. So um, we're looking at more uh, contemporary means of addressing crime problems using the manpower that we have and, and you know, policing smart, not hard. I think those are good decisions, Chief. Thank you. The, I also wanted to mention what you all already did, but just notice again the number of applicants that we have for our, our police academy. Yes. I was looking back at some of the other, so a year ago it was 33. Then second quarter, 46, third quarter, 63, fourth quarter, 97, and this time 130, 130-something, 130 um, 132. That's four times what it was a year ago and twice what it was six months ago. And, you know, so it's gone up each quarter, which is great. Yes. Um, do, does it have the is the word out about the fact that our pay is higher in Durham now that you know these that we have these uh, bonus opportunities and so forth and incentives and incentives yeah I think it's a combination of uh, what has been provided to the police department by this body the incentives of course pay increases that always helps I think um, the recruitment unit has stepped outside of the box after sitting down and really brainstorming with the command staff about, you know, how do we attract people not just to come to a police department but come to a city. And um, thinking in terms of being more creative in our recruitment approach, not just going after um, police officers but their families and selling the city as being a great place, you know, to raise a family. So the holistic approach to recruiting, I think, is really important, and um, and also making a, a concerted effort to um, consider diversity in our recruiting, to to make sure that we're reaching um, all communities. Uh, I've been surprised that in in recent months, uh, many of our our Durham natives have um, been in the numbers, uh, 
large numbers mm -hmm. come into our um, our um, physical agility um, exams in the mornings, and I stopped through there. It could be 40, um, sometimes 45 folks out there that great. are still interested in being in this career field. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really good to see those numbers. Very, really encouraging, and and also counter to the national trend. And so I was just really pleased to see it. Um, you talk about the procedural justice training, the six hours. Yes. I was re I'm really pleased that we're, we've instituted the procedural justice training, and um, is six hours enough? It doesn't seem like a lot. And so I'm wondering, you know, what are your thoughts about that? Well, procedural justice training, it's important, but there, there are different components of um, procedural justice training. The whole community policing block, along with procedural justice, de-escalation <laughs> training, along with it, just, you know, uh, the full gamut of mm -hmm. what impacts the community and how do we change our image in the community or across the country. But the procedural justice training is not just a one-time hit. It is training that we plan to continue and have different levels of advanced procedural justice training. As a matter of fact, today one of our instructors has been asked to be uh, part of the Department of Justice National Training Team. Uh, he has delivered um, procedural justice training in this area, does a phenomenal job, and we plan to continue to do train the trainer so that we have more individuals. But to your point, we're, we're really working with schedules, and I talked about this before, our schedules right now aren't what they need to be to get as much training uh, as, we, as we would like to, but that is changing quickly. We are working on what our new training model will look like annually. Because uh, for me, training is core. It is key to a successful organization. And um, I mean, we, we want to avoid training liability, not giving our officers the tools that they need in order to do a good job. So we'll be working on getting more hours in. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then just lastly, I just wanted to uh, say how uh, uh, the, there were several stories that you all had included in this report. Uh, Life-saving activities through crisis intervention. Yep. Just wanted to cite some of those. Officers Johnson and Ugolik, I'm not sure how you pronounce that name. I'm o not either. Officer, yeah. <laughs> Officer Supernaw and Burke Strasser. Officer Hunter, Henderson, Harris. Officer Duke, officers Taylor and Preston all were involved in life-saving activities through crisis intervention. Yep. And also just the courageous acts of officers Warnicky and Hollingsworth. Uh, both were the descriptions of what they did to keep other people safe. It was quite remarkable. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so I just did want to cite them um, and appreciate all of them. Uh, and then finally, again, uh, just the, I think this, the traffic stop change is, is very, very significant for our community. It's something that, that we worked on for a long time as a council and that you all have worked on for a long time. And it's great to see the policy and the implementation come together in that significant a change. So thank you so much. Thank you. We plan to continue to capture that data so that we can periodically report on it and be able to gauge what our progress is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chief, thank you so much for the information that you shared, and thank you so much for all the good work that the men and women of the department do. Um, how, how do you, how would you answer the um, critics of policing uh, who would say that the overall stops uh, have been decreased, but the probable cause um, reason for the stops uh, have gone up significantly since we passed the uh, consent search uh, policies? Well, the consent search policy is sort of a new concept even for me. So when officers are confronted with how best to do their job, and they know that there is a level of oversight, what we're looking for is we're looking for quality stops. The demographics of the stops, 
They do make a difference, but at, when, at the end of the day, we're looking for quality stops that are meaningful, that aren't targeted, and by capturing this data, it helps us to see what the trends are. A probable cause stop is what I would like to be stopped on based on probable cause, or anybody in this room would like to be considered that. It, it's not a petty stop, it's not I'm being picked on, it's not that you're targeting my particular community. And some of it, it, it is perception that certain communities are being targeted. However, um, I, don't, I don't have any uh, empirical data to, to prove that, but I do know that when we have policies in place that we can trust and hold our officers accountable and evaluate on a regular basis and capture this kind of data, we'll be able to see trends. So the, what I would say is that I hope that our community members will trust that we're moving in a direction that I think is procedurally just. And uh, we will continue to, to monitor this and provide that information as a means of transparency. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief Davis, first of all, I just want to say uh, how remarkable it's been um, to have you in our community. I rarely go to a community event where I don't either see you or find out you were there ahead of me um, and have gone on to something else. <laughs> Uh, so I just want you to know how much of a difference that makes in the life of our city. Uh, I can't tell you the number of folks that I have encountered who have talked about not only the extent of your personal involvement in our community, but also the meaningful nature of that involvement, how many conversations you've had with people about their concerns regarding the police department and with crime in our city, and it just makes an incredible difference having you here with us, and I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to agree with my, with my colleague, Councilmember Shul, Shul, that there are some incredible stories in this report. I know that the department does good work in trying to get those stories out and, and let folks know the good work that the police department does. Uh, and I just want to thank you for making those efforts as well because I do think that makes a difference. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the numbers. Um, I know that uh, we're all disappointed that the Crime numbers have gone up compared to the first quarter of last year. But I did want to note that the areas in which it's increased the most, and, and by that I mean where the bulk of the numbers come from, are uh, with respect to crimes of robbery, larceny, and motor vehicle theft. And I know that those are areas where you have already invested a considerable amount of energy um, and resources trying to fight or combat those particular types of crimes. So I think while it is a disappointment to see those increases, I take comfort from the fact uh, that this is something that you've been on the case for uh, for many months. You, we've, you and I have talked about the, those particular numbers, um, and I look forward uh, to continuing to work on those. Um, I did want to call out the, the homicide number specifically. I know with numbers as small as homicides are at any given quarter that it's hard to sort of claim credit for a significant drop as that, but I think it is remarkable um, that last year at this time uh, we, were, we were in a considerably worse position than we are today, and I just want to call that out as something uh, worthy of note. Um, I also wanted to ask you really quick, when I, the, the numbers for crimes involving rape um, are up 35 percent over the last quarter. Uh, then there was, a cons there was also an increase from 2015 to 2016 mm -hmm. as well, um, comparable number. Um, in percentage terms, and I just wanted to mention that often when I see an increase like that, it's not that I think more folks are out there committing the crime of rape, but instead it gives me the sense that maybe something has changed mm -hmm. in the way that these crimes are being investigated um, such that uh, more victims of sexual assault are willing to come forward and willing to talk about the fact that they have been assaulted. Can you talk a little bit about anything that may have changed in the way that that's being investigated or those victims are, are, are dealt with in the system that might help them be more forthcoming? Yes, actually, um, we talked about that earlier today and um, earlier during the week just to get an idea of the nature of those particular incidents. And I found that the number of reported rapes has increased, although the majority of those cases were domestic violence cases or by a 
individuals that were associated, you know, uh, with each other, which um, sort of, I mean, anytime you have a situation like that, you're alarmed by it, but I was just wanting to make sure, and as we discussed, that we didn't have some type of um, systemic kind of problem that, that was going on. Um, our, we have very good domestic violence investigators, and when they respond, they have um, all of the training to try to coach victims into to participating, and sometimes victims change their mind, especially depending on their, their living situation, uh, but we have our crisis intervention folks and also our domestic violence uh, team to actually try to work to get whatever type of information or evidence that we can when we see victims that might feel compelled not to to report. But that number was alarming to me initially, but then after doing a deeper dive, found out most of these were, were domestic violence sort of situations. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. I just wanted two more uh, issues I wanted to touch on. You, you um, I felt didn't give yourself enough credit with respect to the response times on priority one calls for service uh, for the first quarter. You identified um, that the average response time was 6.08 minutes and that our target is 5.8 minutes. But I did want to call out that um, I pulled up uh, your uh, 2016 year-end report and identified that for the year of 2016, the um, average response time was 6.3 minutes. Um, and this is something that I have been um, concerned about since I've been on the council is how we bring down that average response time. You know, that's the way that most folks um, interact with law enforcement is by calling 911 and asking and trying to get an officer to come help them. Um, and so that is really, to me, a measure of how well our, our city government is working, right. how well we are providing that level of service. And I, I really, really appreciate uh, the change uh, that's happening, the reduction that's happening in addition. Um, uh, the number of calls that are responded to in less than five minutes, uh, the mm -hmm. first quarter of 2017 was at 54 percent, and I believe the first year, the first uh, year 2016 number is 51 percent. Mm -hmm. So again, that's also increasing, and I think that is worthy of praise as well. Um, I didn't want to let that you, you didn't toot your own horn quite enough uh, in that presentation, and I wanted to give you a little a heads up that I thought that was fantastic. Thank the other you. thing, just briefly, on the issue of the traffic searches, um, I just want to share uh, Council Member Shule's uh, praise for the department and the hard work that you're doing to make sure that more of these searches um, are bolstered by probable cause. I think one of the things, um, I'm, as a former prosecutor, I understand that, um, that many of the cases uh, that were previously handled, many of the searches that were previously handled, handled as consent searches, uh, were probably also had a, an element of probable cause to them. And the consent search, especially a verbal consent search, is much easier for a patrol officer to engage in with, uh, with a member of the public uh, that they stop. And so putting in the requirement for a written consent search uh, was always going to see some level of increase in probable cause searches just because some of those searches used to be handled as consent searches. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will say that one of the things that, that I am most heartened by is the, um, is the productivity of those searches uh, that you're doing uh, and the fact that the number of traffic stops and searches are down. I think that shows uh, just, what, um, uh, just what Mr. Scheiss, is it? Scheiss. Scheiss mm -hmm. said is that, um, is that the searches are uh, because those searches are now more, more likely to be bolstered by probable cause. Yeah. If you have a reason to suspect the contraband is there, it, I would hope that those searches would be more productive than a straight consent search. And I think as the percentage of all searches that our consent searches goes down um, and the more probable cause searches we, as a percentage of all searches, the more of them are probable cause, uh, the m it's right and that we should see more uh, hits for contraband. And so. Um, I just think that shows, again, the work that this council has done uh, over the last three years, uh, long before I joined the council, uh, to really listen to the community's concerns uh, about this type of practice and to really incorporate that into the day-to-day -day practice of our law enforcement officers. And as a member of the council who's been concerned about this issue for many years, I take that as very, very positive, uh, both for um, the types of searches that we're doing, but also for the relationship 
uh, between the people of the city and our police department. Uh, restoring that relationship of trust and confidence has been one of my top priorities since I've been here, and I know it has been yours as well. And I just appreciate all the work that's gone into that. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Johnson. I thought I was no, thank, you. Wrap here. thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Chief Davis. I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about the body cameras um, mm -hmm. and how you all are using the footage. If you could just talk a little bit more about how that's going. Well, we are in the process of standing up a body camera unit. And in order to stand up that unit, we already have a couple of folks that are assigned to the unit. The, um, the work that is required to run the program is laborious to, to say the least. Um, to download 20,000 videos, we have to also establish a, a, a means of auditing just to check to see whether or not officers are turning on their cameras when they're supposed to turn them on, whether um, we identify something in footage, even though it's not associated with any type of incident. The audit will help us to identify times when there's some concerns that might need to be um, addressed. Uh, as of right now, we're utilizing the footage to help, with, help the officers with their reports as well. Say, for instance, traffic accidents and uh, things of that nature, and also our internal affairs investigations when there is a complaint against an officer so that um, the internal affairs investigators can look at the footage to see what, that whatever happened on the scene or what the officer said happened on the scene is a, aligned with what happens on the footage. I hope that helped answer. Yes, that's great. Thank you. Um, so I can't remember the specifics of the new body camera law, but I um, know that you are required to sign off on any. I'm not sure if it's viewing or just release, but I'm wondering if anyone has come and asked to see footage that they were a part of, if you've handled any of those requests yet. It's still so new. I don't, I don't think so. Not yet. Not saying that that won't happen, but not yet. Now, of course, we've allowed body camera footage to be seen by individuals who are a part of that particular investigation. Um, but outside of that, I don't think we've had any requests. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and I just had one question about the searches. Um, if you find a gun um, in a vehicle, is if it's legally in the vehicle, is that um, like excluded from the hit rate? If it's a, yeah, that's excluded because if it's a legally owned weapon, it's, it's not considered as contraband. Um, and also the money, I wasn't sure if there's like, like at what point is money contraband? If it's associated with drug activity or if it's hit on by uh, uh, one of our canines, it's associated with um, drug activity. Uh, other than that, money is put into property as, as property. Not evidence, but just property. So if so, if you find money but not drugs, then it's not it's not confiscated. Or it's something. not confiscated. It's not confiscated as evidence. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Chief, and thanks again for leaving Councilwoman Shepherd behind <laughs> in Atlanta. <laughs> Coming here. Uh, first of all. Uh, I just want to appreciate, to show appreciation for your work and your visibility in the uh, community. I'm really uh, heartened by uh, Captain Edwards' initiative in McDougal Terrace, is well received by the residents, and I think I went out on the, um, during the week, uh, of vacation, spring vacation. So the kids and everybody was there. It was just a wonder, wonderful event. Um, I appreciate and trust your expertise. Thank you. Uh, you're really doing an outstanding job. And um, Mr. Bonfield certainly made um, the right decision when he yeah. brought you to Durham. I'm not trying to make you. Yeah, I'll help your ego. Yeah. 
But thank you so much for all that you're doing, your focus on the youth and uh, holding everybody accountable, uh, including us. Thank you. Thank you. Can I say something? I just want to, um, to say that this today is my 11th month here. It doesn't seem like it's been almost a year, but um, this is my 11th yeah, you month. Came in I know. June. Yeah. <laughs> I know. But um, during that time, I have had to lean on these guys heavily. And uh, we've had some long discussions, some hard work. And I cannot take credit for some of the work that has been done in Durham Police Department without my executive team. They don't ask for any kind of recognition or anything like that, but they work long hours and overtime trying to make sure the officers are complying and doing the things and, and following along with the various general orders and the changes and the organizational change. So I just wanted to take an opportunity to uh, publicly thank them for the work that they do every, every day. Thank you. Chief, um, I, I add my compliments that you've heard uh, tonight in terms of your leadership and uh, your team. You. I, I just wish that somehow the audience that we had earlier had been around to hear this report. Uh, and uh, I don't know if they would have heard it or listened to it or not, but I, I think it's, it's quite a contrast in terms of some of the things I heard early this evening versus what I'm hearing now relative to uh, what this police department is doing and continue to do to try to protect this community and still make itself well acquainted to the residents of this community. I, I, when, when you, I want to ask a little bit about the hits that you did during your traffic stops. And you define hits with money, contrabands, guns, and et cetera. H have you broken any of that down in terms of the searches and whether or not how many of them have re resulted in weapons? Do you have that level of detail? I don't, I don't know. Kelly. From the search data, I don't know. Well, let, let me tell you why, where, where I'm going with that. Uh, I'll say this to my colleagues. Uh, when we had the meeting at our round table reduction meeting, I, I kept focusing on the year 2013, which mm -hmm. was a year where the level of nonviolent crime in this community was almost at a low. And I looked at it from 2013 up until where we are now, and it's been a, pretty much in a constant rise. But when you break down violent crime in terms of violent crime with weapons and violent crime with no weapons, the violent crime with no weapons has been pretty steady. But when you look at violent crime with weapons, it's almost been a 100% increase in activity that's happened. I was asking the, the, the chief, why, 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 was, why was there such a rise in violent crime? And she said guns, and I, I hadn't really looked at it. But I mean, as much as I've been looking at that data, I hadn't really looked at how much of an increase we've had with violent crime, with weapons in this community. So my question, again, in terms of hits, I was trying to see if there was any correlation between the stops that you've made and the weapons that you that were part of the stops uh, over, the, over the years, mm -hmm. and if there's any correlation at all. And you don't have it here. I'm going to ask you now, but I'd just be interested in seeing uh, in the stops that you had, how much. Yeah. Um, you know, we have started capturing data, not necessarily from the, from the um, traffic stops. We started capturing data on crimes committed with a firearm. And even those crimes where there wasn't a victim that was actually shot, the number of crimes committed with firearms, whether drive-by shootings or whether um, aggravated assaults or whatever the case might be, has increased exponentially, yeah. just, just as we have started capturing those numbers. But what is also glaring is even today, as we talk about the watch commander's reports and looking at those watch commander reports, the officers that are getting guns off the street, by far most of them are stolen weapons. That scenario plays out over and over and over again. 
it's almost like you don't even have to run the weapon. You just know it's another stolen weapon. So there are more guns on the street, um, and, uh, and I do uh, think that that has a lot to do with the increase in violent crime. And I, I'm, I'm not trying to get away with what you've done about stops. Uh, I mean, I, I was one of the advocates for a written consent search after the Human Relations Commission came out with it. But I, I'm just, I'd still like to know if there's any correlation with the fact that we don't have as many stops now. Uh, are we seeing less guns in those stops versus what we had in the past when we had more stops and we were capturing more guns when that was happening? And we might be able to capture okay. that data. All yeah. right. We have the report, so I'm pretty sure we might be able to capture that data, right. at least so that we can do a comparison. So it's, just, it's just too many guns on the street. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. And most of them, as you said, are probably illegal, either yeah. been stolen or whatever you've got. Are, are there other comments or questions of, of the chief or staff? I recognize the mayor pro tem. How often do we get requests, do you get requests from neighborhoods to do traffic stops Well, in, in the particular areas? I guess I get, Rick, do you all get a lot of requests from the community? Okay. Okay. And so when that happens, when you get the request, you have to well, there go are, out and there are opposing forces going on there. We have to find ways to address whatever the issue is. Sometimes it's not by, you know, um, traffic stops. Sometimes we do um, speed types of um, details, especially if mm -hmm. someone calls and says we, we have traffic issues in our community, it may not necessarily need to be a checkpoint. It might need to be that we're running radar. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we come up with whatever means of dealing with the crime issue as opposed to um, allowing a community member just say, this is going to fix the problem, set up a checkpoint right here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. No further questions, Chief. Again, thank you, and your Command staff. Thank okay. you all. Let, let me ask this question again. Is anything else coming for the council that the mayor missed? If not, meetings adjourn at 9, 24 p.m. Thank you.